takes. And I want to welcome everybody. We just started to go live here, both on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. So we're going to give it another minute for everybody to uh, see if everybody can get in OK. Uh, I may be able to see any comments posted on YouTube or Facebook should also be appearing where I can review them. It might be a bit of a lag of, uh, you know, definitely a lag somewhere between 15 to 20 seconds. So uh, part of this session today will be to take any comments or questions you have uh, since we're gonna focus on Third World War series. But again, I just wanna hold for another uh, minute or so just to make sure everybody's getting in okay. And also I'm gonna go right now, I'm looking off at a side screen in case you're wondering why I look off screen sometimes away from the camera. Uh, I'm just going to look at uh, our Facebook feed just to make sure we're actually live, that it's working. So uh, let me go ahead and uh, check that now. And again, welcome if you're just joining us. I know a lot of people are at work, so uh, hopefully you're catching this. Uh, yep, it's working. I see uh, Facebook is live, and I'm sure YouTube is as well. So wonderful. So again, uh, hi, Eric. Good to see you. Thanks for joining. So we've got Eric here on off the YouTube channel. And I promised 2 o'clock, so I don't see 2 o'clock yet. So we'll, we'll wait another minute, and then we'll get started. All right, everybody, I want to welcome you to this uh, special session of Compass Games Live. Uh, today, we're going to be doing a special project update. It's one of our largest projects to date, which is the Third World War series. So uh, if you're not familiar with it, here's a bit of a screenshot based on our uh, website, our product page. It's available for pre-order today. And uh, if you can recall, this is actually four games in one package. Uh, which were originally published by GDW. So we're combining all four games into one package. And as you can imagine, this is a very large project. So I think we reached a point uh, in terms of hitting a milestone with the project that I want to get a project update out. You'll notice that on the Compass uh, product page, I haven't posted any images yet. I'll get those posted uh, tomorrow morning. So this is sort of an unveiling, official unveiling, if you will of uh, some of the graphics that are now completed for the game that are actually going to the printers. So we're going to talk, we're going to do some show and tell today about the maps and the counters. And to help me along those lines, I have a special guest who's joining us. So please, uh, if we could real quick, I want to welcome uh, Chris. Welcome to our, uh, Chris Fawcett, welcome to our broadcast today. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. It's a pleasure to have you here. So just some background information. Chris has been on before. Uh, for a Compass Games Live episode. You want to mention what it was for, Chris, to remind everybody what you were on last time for? I, I was ab actively shilling my new Bar Lev game. <laughs> exactly. That's been out now. It's been so, out. Bar Lev's been shipping for uh, some time now. It's been doing really well. I notice also on Facebook there's been a gentleman uh, playing Bar Lev, and he's been posting updates uh, last for the last week. I think he's around game turn five or six now. So I've been in, enjoying watching that, and I'm going to make sure we post some of that uh, also on our Facebook page. So, yeah, great job in Bar Lev. Do you want to mention really quickly before we get to the topic at hand what project you're working on today? Uh, other your own project, your own design work? Sure. Um, like like with Bar Lev, I, I wanted to tackle an older game I enjoyed when I was younger, and uh, designed by the same the same gentleman, Frank Chadwick. I'm a big fan of his. And um, I uh, tackled the uh, Fall of Tobruk game that, uh, that he did, kind of using some of the same system to details as was in Bar Lab. They're very, very similar yeah. in, in, in uh, the mechanics. But there's some things in there that were just really, I think at the time in the mid-70s, uh, were quite innovative. And I think even now they're, they're still pretty innovative. So I want to kind of hold those up. In, in, a, in a new design, I, I, I want to call it a new edition, but it, it really borders on a, a significant update. Yeah. It, again, it's it started with an order of battle uh, tweak, and it's just kind of <laughs> gotten out of control and turned into a uh, rather a new game. But uh, yeah. uh, in addition to the Fall of Tobruk, I'm looking at uh, for the Gazala battles in 1942. I'm looking at one for. Uh, using the same system for the Operation Crusader timeframe um, in in late 1941, early 42. So I think the there was some uh, amazing struggles going on between the Egyptian border and 
the Port of Tobruk back and forth and back and forth. And I think I'm going to try to capture those in a, in a couple of titles. Great. Fantastic. So I just want to mention briefly for everybody, we're going to go ahead and uh, obviously talk about the Third World War series today. But before I do so, um, I do want to take a moment to recognize our project team members. Uh, uh, Chris obviously is, is part of our project team. And, and uh, I have Chris here to talk about the project. But I, I want to take a moment just to recognize the entire project team. I hope to have some more uh, team members on at a later date when we get closer to shipping. But I want to thank uh, first Bruce Urian. Bruce is our artist for the game. He's done all the maps and counters you're, you're going to see today. He did the front box cover, which you see on the website. So I want to thank Bruce Urian for all his work on the graphic design. I want to take, thank uh, Eric Farrago, who's joined us uh, today live. Eric's been a, a key member of the project team. And he's also got uh, Manchurian Front, which is a, a, a follow-on release using the same system. Third World War series, but on Manchurian Front, we're looking forward to publishing that game. Also, we have Greg Warren. Greg Warren's another one of our project leads for the project, um, other than Chris Fawcett as well. Uh, Lloyd uh, Bonagura, I hope I pronounced Lloyd's last name okay. Uh, he's a team member as well. Uh, Pat, Mul Pat Mulvihill's uh, been a team member, and he's actually part of a cadre of uh, folks that actually came out of a uh, Consum World Expo, and they had a lot of good feedback uh, on new displays we could perhaps add to the game. And uh, they provided all their materials to the project team, so that's something we're, we're definitely looking at as well. So great to have uh, Pat involved. And, uh, and, and, I'll, and of course, uh, Frank Chadwick's been an adv advisor to us on the project. And I think it's worth mentioning that Frank Chadwick has an advisory role. And what we're doing is we're not, and this is important, we're not changing making wholesale changes to the design of Third World War series. The scope of this project, just to be perfectly clear for the product page, is we are uh, updating the overall package with new graphics. Uh, you'll, see the, you'll see the enhancements that we're making to the game as well, but we're not um, changing, we're not changing the game system, the rules, we're not changing the order of battle. Uh, if we change the order of battle with all the new materials that are available today, that would be about a one to two year effort based on all the new plate, all the play testing required to check for balancing because it would be a completely different order of battle. And that's something game designer Bruce Maxwell is going through right now with his NATO designer signature edition project, completely different order of battle that he's researched. And we've been heavy in play testing for several months. It's a completely different game. That's what would have happened to the Third World, World War series if we updated order of battle, be a completely different game. And we didn't want to do that. We want to honor the original design from Frank Chadwick, but embellish and enhance it as much as we can. So that's that's the that's the goal for this uh, Third World War series is to enhance it, and then we have a good base of the game, which we can then look at updating the order of battle with a, a brand new second edition, completely different. But that's for another day, and that's very far off based on all the effort needed. This is a way to get the game out uh, to everybody quickly. So I hope that's a fair recap that I just did, Chris, as far as the, the scope is limited to honoring the uh, original game design and not mucking with it, not making wholesale changes just for chain sake. Right, right, right. That, that's, that's been a kind of a theme throughout because we've been asked a lot of different times, hey, you're gonna fix, you're gonna fix the air units order of battle, you're gonna fix the British, you're gonna fix, the, there's so much fixing that can be done. And um, it's really not, as you said, it's not part of the scope, but I don't think it's really what we're what we wanted uh, is to um, to to go out there and get a, a you know a 1995 order of battle. The, the game was designed in the mid 80s for a late 80s, early 90s kind of time frame. So all of the the units and the conjecture about what would what the units would look like yeah. at that time is is still is, is still something we stuck with. In the benefit of hindsight, uh, you know, the whole thing is moot because in 1989, yeah. the, uh, the opportunity for anything like that to happen, or I should say the specter of anything like that, this game to happen, hopefully vanished. Yeah. Uh, the I, I to, Berlin Wall and all. And I have to say you and the project team members have been fantastic. But to let everybody know, this project's been active for about two years. It's a huge project. Uh, to be specific here, here's the original GDW four game releases. So we're taking these four games, combining them into one, and the amount of sheer work needed to take these four games and you have to reproduce the map, you have to reproduce every single counter. Although, well, I take that back. 
we start by reproducing, but then we enhance. And, and we'll talk about the changes uh, we've made. We'll, we'll do some show and tell today. But those are the four games you know, we're basically having to start with. I'd say the proofing process up to now, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, doing the, we have six full-size game maps for all four games together. We'll talk about the maps in a moment. We've got eight full counter sheets for the game. Mm -hmm. Proof all those against an original, plus all the changes we made uh, to the counters to enhance them. What, three to four, uh, I think that's an order of magnitude, three to four months for proofing of maps, three to four months. A minimum, yeah. Each, yeah, uh, three or four months for each of those, each of those sets of components. And it was, uh, it was a very intensive review process as well. Um, it's not just one set of eyeballs looking at the maps. You know, we had, we had six to eight sets of eyeballs on it, and we all took turns looking at different aspects of each element. And the, uh, the the detail and the attention to detail by the whole team has been just fantastic. We've been finding things each of us, each of the others have missed. So we're, you know, we're, we're definitely covering each other's uh, flanks and, and with all of that. And I think it's been, uh, it's helped create a, a much more, um, I don't want to say correct uh, version, but it certainly helped weedle out all those little gremlins that pop up. Right, and that's why I'm showing Mark's comment. I love Mark's question to us. And and this is a question I get all the time on the Designer Signature Edition series because uh, that the, the whole concept of that series is to take a game that's been published already and then look to enhance it and not necessarily change it for change's sake unless the designer comes and says, I definitely want to take another swing at the bat and make some wholesale changes to the design. Uh, most of the Designer Signature Edition games we've done up to now haven't had these type of wholesale changes. They've just been to really improve the game. So Mark, Mark, you ask a great question. Like, I don't know if this new edition is in it for me. So I'm dedicating this broadcast to Mark Grad because it's all about, you know, what's the effort? Uh, of, we've got six to eight project team members who have years of experience with the game. The idea is to bring all that uh, you know, combine shared expertise and experience together of how could the game be better? Same game, but how could it be better? Uh, and then, of course, having Frank Chadwick there to make sure we don't go off the rails, that we're following his design intent, because that's very important to us. Mm -hmm. So I love your so I, I love your question, Mark. Uh, great question. And this session is really going to talk about specifically what changes have been made to the game. So with that, and without any uh, further ado, let's go ahead and... Uh, and start talking about the project and do some show and tell here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna uh, start sharing and I'm gonna bring up, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the first piece which is the combined maps uh, for Europe. So what we see right now, uh, let me uh, actually, we don't see it yet. Um, Give us that eye candy, John. Sorry, it's not sharing, is it? Um, <laughs> My screen sharing is not sharing for some reason, so I'm not sure what's going on. Let me try to share my screen again. Uh, let's try again. I lost my connect. There we go. Yeah, we're back. So what we see here is you're seeing four of the six full-size 22 by 34-inch maps with one big change in addition made to the maps. If you can maybe comment, Chris, from a project perspective, what change did we make to the map sheets at a, at a big level? Well, the first thing is that uh, we're trying to standardize on the, the, the new size of map sheets uh, for printing purposes. So uh, we had an opportunity to fill in uh, a what was originally a gap in the center of the eastern edge of the board, and that was in the area of Poland and Eastern Europe. So the if you'll remember, what you're seeing just to the right of center and further to the east into the Soviet Union, none of that existed in the original game. It, even the center of Poland itself was a big cutout. And there was, a, we don't need it for gameplay purposes of this one. We're not envisioning a, you know, a, a NATO counteroffensive to the gates of Moscow, but we're trying to create not just something for this game, but we have future considerations in mind as well. And we've got the map built from the beginning to allow us to do some expansions uh, later on. So, but we've got that center section of Poland and Eastern Europe and the Baltic states fleshed in so that yeah. that gives us a better feel for how the, uh, how the, where the troops are coming from, how the trains laid out. And I think Bruce's style here tries, we try to mimic 
as much as possible the look and feel of uh, Paul Banner's uh, original graphic uh, approach to the game. And for the for the map, at least, I think we've we've met that. We got a little bit more uh, accurate coastlines and all that, but we really did stick with the original map display as much as possible, just tweaking it and, and improving it a little bit. So we can see um, there you can see in the middle of the Netherlands off to the left side and, and another spot in Germany where the, the U.S. Pomkus, um, instead of putting a marker on the map or a nondescript triangle, we put we posted the Pomkus sites on there. We've got the air theater displays very prominently on there, whereas before it was a description in the rules. Now it's on the map, very easy to see. Uh, same thing with, uh, you know, the port symbols. We've highlighted those so they're much easier to, to, to call out. The, I think the borders stand out a little bit more. A and I, we tried to also, if you, you, there we've got uh, just the rich terrain in, 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 in Western Germany, very there's not a lot of strategic depth in this in this game, but uh, there's certainly a lot of artistic depth. And right. So how it's right, and I think that's the first thing. So the first thing I want to share with those, you know, wondering about what's what's you know changed here with the new uh, designer signature edition is we've added those air boundary lines. That's that's something new that's added. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the Pumpkis uh, mark. You know, the Pumpkis sites are now on the map. Um, I think we cleaned up, I think we also cleaned up one of the, uh, was it the, uh, not the nationality border, but the actual, we changed or adjusted, I believe one of the air theater borders. Is that correct? And that, that's, uh, if you can scroll over to the right a little bit, you can let folks see it a little bit easier. The, the air boundary between the Western, what was just the Western and we're calling it Western Europe now because we're, we're making a new one for that new map area. Um, but the, the Northern Air Theater, the Arctic Air Theater is, was um, kind of went around Denmark. So, and that was because Denmark was part of the printed part of that map was in the original game and there wasn't an Arctic front when it was first printed. But in reality, the, the operational objectives of the Soviet forces, the pact forces for the, that Northern Theater and as well as NATO include Denmark in the north. So yeah. we we wanted to include that operational planning in how the the and kind of guide the the players to to follow those operational objectives. So we we included this this new line in here that gives us and it cuts cuts across the northern part of Germany and the northern coast um, of uh, Poland as well because those forces Actually, if we look at Soviet operational planning maps, those forces were driving across that area in uh, on those uh, situation maps. So that's really what they were intending to do or trying to do, or at least you know, they were showing us on their map. So that's that's right. a little bit more um, real, realistic or more historically accurate based upon what we know. Right. So I think, I think that uh, I think that's going to give us a little bit better better flow there as well. That gives us a little bit of um, challenges. That created some challenges because it wasn't based upon sea zone boundaries or, or borders, which was purely purely on borders. This we departed from that for the Northern Theater, but everywhere else, it uh, you know it follows a, according to uh, what the original rules were. So if you go down to the Balkans, the Balkan Theater, the Southwest Theater, the Persian Gulf Theater, those are all still following their general geographic areas according to how they were originally designed. So speaking of the Persian Gulf, so, so far I've shown four of the six maps uh, for the game. And uh, as we mentioned, we, you know, it's sort of like a bonus map area, but to make them the maps adjoin nicely, we added that central uh, part of Russia, which is brand new, uh, something we plan to take advantage of in the future. But here we have the two maps uh, for the uh, Persian Gulf. So those familiar with the Persian Gulf game from, uh, from this series, uh, you'll be very familiar with these maps. I don't know if there's anything here to add as far as the maps here, uh, Chris. Um, to mention? Well, if you can zoom in on on part of that, and maybe in the desert, there, there was some difficulty. We felt there was some difficulty in distinguishing between some of the areas where were identified as as wilderness terrain versus the nor the, the normal version of that same terrain type. It's like wilderness sand versus just sand or wilderness clear. I think we made that. Uh, 
uh, a little bit clearer, easier to, to distinguish on the map here. So the, the mottled area is there in the middle of the screen along the Saudi and Iraqi border. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the wilderness. Right there, right along that borderline. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, hopefully, hopefully the graphic implementation here is a little bit easier to 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 understand. It's a little bit more intuitive. It, not that there was a major problem with the original, but I think we we made it even clearer, even easier to read. Right. Yeah. yeah I agree. The mountain passes are a little bit more visually appealing than rather than just stark white lines. Right. 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 Mountains. Right. So again, hats off to Bruce Nearian for all the artwork and then obviously the project team, you know, closely involved. To, I know there was a lot of discussions on the project site. You know, how do we treat certain terrain? How do we make it look so it's both pleasing to the eye, yet having functional maps? So it's very clear what the terrain types are that we have on the map. So I think overall, I'm seeing some favorable comments uh, from those online now that uh, are watching us live that uh, do like what they're seeing with the maps. So they're really meant to be functional maps, easy to use. Um, so as you can see, not too many changes made to the map. So if you have uh, the original games, you know, we've, we've done a few things to enhance it, but not, you know, we haven't done too much. Now, this is where things start, uh, this is where things start sort of taking hold. So I'm going to, I'm going to. Let's take a look at the next part, which is the, uh, the unit the right. unit key, which kind of holds everything together here. Right. So this is a this is going to be a big change. So let me go ahead and uh, share my screen again. So this, <laughs> this, this is a big improvement to uh, this is where a lot of the sweat equity and work has gone into the enhanced design is how we've worked with units. So I know we've got a lot of color coding, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on the units themselves. So let's yeah. let's take a moment to talk about what has happened to the units before we show the counter sheets. I want to show here's some details of how to read the units. Let's talk a little bit about what mm -hmm. I've done with the counters, the unit counters in the game. Okay. Well, let's look at the land units on the side, on the left side there. Yeah. We have uh, the what, what we tried to do is put some of the information that was embedded in the rules right at the player's fingertips, right on the counters themselves, wherever we could. So some of the things, for example, was this special notation whether a unit had chemical, nuclear uh, capability or or, or um, had limited military capabilities. Those were things that were just mentioned by um, certain types of units or certain nationalities of units. Now we get a little mnemonic right, mnemonic right there on the counter to help us. The same thing is true of the stacking points and mobility class, which is right below that special notation. So we've kind of we've added some things that weren't on the original counters to help with the flow of the game. I think of these tiny little pinpricks yeah. of improvements will add up and it will give us a net playability increase. Having stacking point values right there rather than having to look at a chart off map, let us know that you know we've got, you can just look at your stack of counters to find out how many stacking points you've got there rather than have to, geez, does these guys have two or three? In some of the, uh, in the original games, some of the um, units of one nationality had differing stacking values. So now, now we've got it right there. Same thing with mobility class. Mobility class is, is super huge, super important. And in the original games, it was you had to know, you had to learn the unit type symbols to really to really get that figured out. And there were always exceptions to the rule. Right now, we you can look at these counters, and and there's a lot more information about how to use them, right there. And then, now, exactly. the, on the air side, for the similar thing, we we took some of the information that was on the back of the counter, such as the maintenance rating. And we put it on the front so that again you don't have to be flipping back and forth whenever you're, you're you're doing something that is that occurs frequently during the turn. So you look at the maintenance ratings on the front. You roll your die and you move it if it if it makes us roll. Other than that, the air units are pretty uh, you know have pretty much the same layout. We had the air superiority rating at the top, ground attack rating in the middle. That was the it's actually as I look at this. Yeah, the ground attack rating uh, for supporting combats is in the middle, and then the, there, there's a strike rating uh, yeah. at the bottom. That's the same layout as the original game. In fact, it's really the only thing we did differently to the packed air units, or the air units in general, was to pull that serviceability, that maintenance rating to the front. 
Right, and then also um, I wanted to mention the amount of, so this goes back uh, to, to the great question about why would I why would I consider a new edition of the game? This is the type of discussion we have as a project team of why we we think you know this is this is a game worth uh, pursuing. It's much more enjoyable to play because of all the mnemonics that are now going to help you play the game. You know, you're not going to have to look stuff up as much, uh, nearly as much, etc. But there's also a, a certain cost to it, as Lloyd mentions here. Uh, you know, the amount of proofing. <laughs> We're not just proofing, you're not just proofing the, um, in other words, we're not just proofing the original GDW version, which we had to do, but then we have uh, another whole series of proofing rounds based on all the additional mnemonic values and symbols we're adding to every counter in the mm -hmm. game, so it's more playable. So that that really gets into this pain point Lloyd's mentioning here about uh, you know how big the effort is, but but this is effort we feel well spent because it, it does make it a richer uh, gaming experience. End of the day, easier to play, more mm -hmm. information you know at your fingertips, if you will, etc. So so uh, you know great job by the team again. Let's go ahead, maybe just segue to the counter sheets, and, and maybe you can talk us through that. I think, think before you go, let's uh, let's zoom out so you can look the the, the unit types together. Yes. No, the one thing I did not mention was this swaths of color across the yeah. units, and, and that's the structure of a bow. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but um, one of the things that we noticed uh, through through playing it, there was a lot of flexibility with regard to where these units ended up on your on your games, and it it, it was very. I hate to use the word historical and ahistorical on a hypothetical scenario, but it really did not fit with the, the usages of these, these units, at least the plans. So the, the units that were slated to go into Germany, for example, aren't gonna end up in Afghanistan. Um, well, at least in the original game, they could. Now uh, we're introducing some optional rules that provide a little bit more structure around how your armies are, are assigned. And that's what all this color coding is. And I don't want to go into too much detail here, but we've introduced something that will help you play a more mm, historical, <laughs> hypothetical game. And right. we've introduced that for both sides. And there's a lot of great... Uh, detail here. So this will be, this is a play aid that will be in in the game that you can look things up. But that's mostly it's uh, we've organized the counters the way the units were organized too. All right. So take a look at the counter sheets. Yeah. Let's go to the counter sheets next. So I'm going to go ahead and show that. So let's do a let's do a walking tour of the counter sheet. So what we see here, and I'll I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead. You can see this fits the counter sheet, but it's a little hard to see. Uh, as far as the size of the screen. So I'm going to go ahead and actually uh, show just a partial sheet just to make it a little more visible on screen for everybody. So if you want to just, what I'll do is I'll do a little show and tell here. So Chris, if you want to okay. comments, what I'm looking at here. Well, uh, one thing is we didn't mention it. The counter's a little bit bigger. All right. So they're going to be able to be easier to handle. And the the so the numbers of all of these, uh, the values and everything that we're trying to cram in here, we're cramming them into a larger space. So the original half inch counters are now uh, nine sixteenth counters. That little sixteenth of an inch makes a difference. It yeah, does. Absolutely. But, uh, uh, and the biggie here, you you can see the color coding. And, and again, I'm not going to go into detail here uh, because that's an optional rule. But the big thing that we took advantage of uh, that I think that was an opportunity lost with the original was these counters are two sided. Uh, and the the main reason for that is that uh, the combat system in this game really drives around the third value in the counters, the, the proficiency value. And there are rules in the game that, um, well, you take combat hits, um, yeah. proficiency, and the, the packed units, once they take at least one um, disruption hit, one proficiency hit, they can never come back to the original values. So, well, that means if you're re regrouping uh, a unit, a, a packed unit back to it, the highest it can get, it's got to carry around a one hit marker. Well, that's the original game was, right. was had that limitation or that burden, if you ask me. Now, when a unit takes its first proficiency hit, hit you just flip it over and it's designated, yep. it's one value less. This is, this is true for not just the packed units, but for everyone. So you're going to have that new mechanic of when you take a hit, you flip over. If you take more hits, we add markers because you can shed those additional hits and therefore get rid of those counters. But for yeah. the 
for the pack, you can't go that far. So that's I a think it's sort of playability nod. Yeah, that's a critical change, I think, for playability. So here's the back of the counter sheet again. So this is to completely different than the GDW uh, release. But as you mentioned, we did that for good reason. I'll move on to sheet number two. If you want to comment about sheet two from the game, I don't know if there's anything uh, here. The, the color coding, the color scheme from the original GDW game was, was not strictly adhered to. For example, we can see the Iraqis are uh, kind of a brighter green here than the original. Uh, which was the, a number of uh, nationalities shared some of the same color palette that Rich had, Rich Banner used. Yeah. We've got a little bit more flexibility from in printing processes now, and we can add more colors. So we tried to open up the, that palette a little bit more and use some of those. But for the most part, the, um, the color schemes should be fairly intuitive. We've got units that are in the desert you know, desert colored and the units up in the Arctic in the north, you know, we've seen, yeah. you know, we've seen some nice, nice colorations there. Some of the things are pretty um, intuitive. Some are very similar. Some of them aren't, aren't, aren't quite the same, but everything should be very easy to distinguish. Yeah. In some cases, it does matter um, for nationality. Stacking rules are very nationality um centric for NATO and for PAC, they're very centric on the armies. Instead of having to look for a small numeric designation on the counter, there's a lot of color coding for that. Great. Yeah, so uh, exactly. So I, I guess <clears throat> I hope everybody can notice with all the color coding going on here to help facilitate play, you know, there was uh, quite a bit of work involved to really try to enhance the overall play experience. There mm -hmm. is four counter sheets total as far as the units go. So here's the last counter sheet number four, Chris. Uh, that we have. Uh, so this is, again, the fourth and final uh, yep. sheet as far as the unit counters go. But again, the big change is they're now back printed. That's really going to have a huge impact on playability for the game, I think. Mm -hmm. So let's move on our discussion um, and let's, let's visit the game markers now because I think game markers is a key area because we're also introducing some new game markers to the game. So again, it's all about making the game very user-friendly, uh, the designer signature edition, uh, one of the key goals of the designer signature edition is when you play this new edition, it's meant to be less work to you. It's meant to be much more enjoyed, much more information at your fingertips. St you know, you need help with housekeeping rules. You know, we've all learned from the original edition of the game. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got over a hundred years combined, I think, play experience with Third World War series. We're not that old. <laughs> yeah. Combined, combined uh, you know, over a hundred years. So, so that's where we can come in and introduce some new markers. So could you talk maybe a little bit about, uh, and here we start with sheet five. So the first four sheets are the unit counters. Sheets five through eight are all the game markers in the game. Can you talk a little bit high level about what changes have been made as far as the addition of new game markers and, and why? Well, yeah, there are a lot of things you had to keep in mind. You had to remember uh, when you're when you're marking things when you're noting things on certain turns, for example, so we, you know when did the war? Especially if you're playing the combined game, which uh, I think that was about the only way I, I ever played it. Once I got all four of the games together, um, and there are things that occur in the combined game that you do have to keep track of. You know, like when does when did the pack mobilize? When did the RDF get alerted? When did this happen? When did that happen? And without um, some of them, some of these uh, events were. We're, we had some counters provided for them, but for the most part, we didn't see that. So instead of having to make up your own homemade counters and stick them on the turn track, we've tried to include all of those for us here. Well, you also have some markers over, and you can see in the center on the left side, we've got uh, uh, ways to track nuclear points, uh, air points, missile points, artillery points, rather than just have values you had to keep on track on scratch paper. We're going to tr have tracks for that so you can keep track of all of those items. Um, these are the, the 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 explosions and smoke at the top. Those are those are strike markers yeah. uh, for for locations on the map. So we know that you know it's a little bit different than proficiency hits now. So we're we're we've got the we had the 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 counter space. So we decided to put some put some unique values out there. So we we maintain these uh, like little explosion um, markers. The red and the blue; those yeah. are going to be for proficiency hits, and you use these um, airstrike markers that are affecting hexes. We've got different markers for that, for example. 
And we threw in, we've got some counter space in there, so we have some control markers that didn't exist in the original game. So it and, and control of spaces is important for determining victory conditions as well. So um, we threw in, like I said, th those control markers in there. We have, um, where are we moving here? Um, up at the top of this sheet, sheet seven here, we've got some um, yellow X markers. Well, we've got a set of those for NATO too. Well, who doesn't use tile spacers to mark things in their games? Well, now we've got counters that look like tile spacers just because we had the space for it. And we wanted to make sure that there's some, some notional, some generic counters to say, you know what, I'm just going to put a mark here. I need to indicate that this unit's going to do something. One thing we took out of here though, was all of the generic odds markers uh, for marking attacks. All you really needed to know uh, in the original game is I'm going to attack here. So we can use these X markers to, to, to mark where the attacks are. Um, constantly in, in play of the game and the combined game, I was running out of the correct odds markers and just ended up using some generic markers anyway. So I think that's an area where we really, the, the idea was okay. It made sense originally, but it, it actually slowed the game down to, to figure out, pre-figure what your odds are, and then you're going to change it anyway. So why don't we just, let's skip that, mark the hex, and we'll figure out the odds when we get there. Yep, perfect. So so I think that gives a good overview of the graphics, uh, a graphic approach we've taken to the game. I think, uh, Chris, it was wonderful to have you on to talk about, uh, as a project team as a whole, what were the concepts we were really uh, sensitive mm -hmm. To, to help uh, aid with gameplay. So what I want to do is a moment is just sort of go through some questions we've got. Uh, again, if you've got some questions on YouTube or Facebook, please feel free to post here. Um, be happy to uh, answer your questions. And please excuse that I might have background noise. I have uh, two French Bulldogs that are fighting at my feet, uh, play fighting. So <laughs> I don't know if you can hear them or not. But uh, let me go ahead. And I'm looking through the questions right now. So I believe somebody had a question about uh, how much uh, table space um, is this going to require? I think James, for example, was asking, what size room do you need to play the game? I was just going to mention to James that the overall size doesn't really change all that much because the original GDW release had pretty big hexes, but very small, Those they had those small half-inch counters. So when we went up to 9 16th inch counters, we didn't have to increase the map size or the hex grid size at all, uh, Chris. So I was just going to mention, as far as the map, other than adding the new area for Central Russia, uh, which is new. We didn't really increase, you know, the maps all that much at all. And I don't think that particular map. I'm I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I can't remember the numbering, lettering, see, uh, see, series for the maps. But that East European map doesn't really need to be added for for uh, a lot of the games. You can you know, those. That's where reinforcements are coming in. And when we have the setup rules, you'll be able to if you're constrained for space. Can you bring Can you bring the map up? Uh, the overview, just kind of the, do you have that still available? Yeah, I'm going to make it, I'm going to bring it up. I just have to shrink it down so it fits. So give me one. Right, right. Just, you see it's really the, the extreme eastern corner of up in the Arctic doesn't extend any further than where it did before. So you've got the same, this is, this, we didn't add anything up by Fenland. That's all the original space. So we really did yeah. not make the footprint larger with this. Uh, with this layout. Yeah, I'd say I, I agree. So I think from a, so for, for asking about how is this going to be bigger than the original, I don't really see that happening with this. I mean, in terms of the maps and the impact, I, I don't really see this larger uh, table space required. The only exception is, uh, you know, we're looking to do additional displays for the game, again, to help with playability, to have them available. Uh, so uh, you'll see the maps are going to stay very clean looking. You don't see a lot of holding boxes on the maps at all. So the, the maps have been kept very clean looking overall. Uh, so the only thing that might change is, you know, yeah, sure, we'll we might have some more displays available to you in the form of player aid cards. Mm -hmm. But that's about it. I mean, in terms of the original size, really, really no changes uh, happening, uh, happening there between the two releases. I think from a practical standpoint, those who uh, want to be able to play this on a... Uh, you know, I always try to play mine on a four foot by eight foot table, but I could never get the Persian Gulf to fit on there. I always had to have a side table for that. But there was plenty of room for uh, the whatever displays I did make up to uh, to help with our, you know, whenever we had a team game of this. I would use parts of the map 
or I could overlay some of the charts, some of the some of the parts of the map that really don't have gameplay um, yeah. requirements, like the middle of the North Sea. But that's a good place to put your uh, your your printed cards, stock the player eight cards, and what have you. Exactly. Well, I've got we're getting some more good questions here. So uh, 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 one question was about uh, will there be a vassal module from Bowden? And uh, yes, absolutely. For every release we do at Compass, our goal is to have a vassal module available at time of release, of course, with uh, basically everything you need, except for, of course, the rules. The rules would be separate, but all the player aid cards, the displays, et cetera. So absolutely, uh, especially a game of this size, I think vassal helps more and more, obviously, mm -hmm. as, as the game gets bigger. So so excellent question uh, from Bowden there. So. Uh, so it shouldn't take too long to to design the to develop the module for this. Some of, some of the modules, some of the games have that have that have gone through a vassal development have complex rules like a hidden hidden deployment or or a fog of war rules. None of that really exists with this game, so we don't need to worry about you know sides right. and, and some of the details in vassal. So it's pretty straightforward. We get the graphics out there, and you just get your counters developed, counters made. Um, so I think it's it will be a very clean module. Uh, the only thing we have is the diplomacy cards will have card play. Other than that, there's right. really and th that's not a draw of a random deck. That's a selection from a hand. So it, even 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 that element of of a vassal module, right? Exactly. And Haro's asking over on YouTube. Uh, maybe you missed it. Are there any rules adjustments in the game? So again, before I just want to preface the answer before Chris might add to my comment. And again, to be very clear, as far as the scope of this particular project, our goal going in was to change as very little as possible. We want to honor the original design. This game has a very rich history and following uh, online. You can find it on Board Game Geek and all the other uh, online destinations. We didn't want to muck up and change the system and the rules, other than to enhance where we could, like we did with the markers. You know what we'll do with the play aids especially the unit counters, you know, Chris went through all the changes to the unit counters, adding a ad, adding a reverse side, which really helps with playing the game, the playability. But as far as like just making rules changes just for the heck of it, no, that is absolutely very clear that we did not do that. What will happen is sometime far off in the future, because it will take a long time, is we have to update the order of battle based on new research that came out, which will trigger a whole new slew of play testing, which will be a completely different game. It will not be a World War series at that point, because the play balance will completely change once the order of battle changes. So yeah. to honor the original. No, we, we really, the only thing that I think, well, we expanded some of the rules that were considered um, um, well, I don't know if they were considered optional. I think they were standardized, but we've turned in any anything that we did change. And the one thing that comes to mind was is the uh, the I'll call, I'll call it the historical organizational constraints put on the players, the usage of the units. That's an optional expansion to uh, um, the limited participation in national national characteristics rules, which are already in the game. We're just going to add some paragraphs that. The players can use the stripes on the counters if they want to and choose to not worry about them if they don't want to. Right. Play the original game as designed, throw in this optional rule if they want. And the, the game system is not changing. The rules are not changing. Right. So for per Mark's question, which several people have asked, um, you can see sort of the sensitivity, like, uh, you know, is this the same game? I, I'd like to know. So yes, yes, absolutely, 100%. Consider this the same game. So if you own the series and enjoy the series already, it's like the same game, but just enhanced for playability. Uh, I'd like to think of it as a smarter game because we've got all this years of experience from those that have sort of suffered the pains of what could be made, could be made easier to play the game. That's what it's really all about is, you know, first question I ask for any project, what can we add for markers or play aids or mnemonics? What can we do to make the game easier and more enjoyable to play? So that's sort of our baseline of how we come into a project. And that's absolutely what we did here was we we stuck with the original. Now, what might happen is we're going to get into the rules uh, next for the game. And somebody asked earlier, I'll try to find it here. Can you play all four games separately? And uh, And yes, absolutely. You can play all four games separately. So these these are all four games. Uh, in one box, so you, you can definitely play them separately, just like you have the originals that were released. But of course, obviously, you know, 
the combined game is is uh, gets the most attention i think from people and i think i've seen the combined game set up on facebook recently somebody's been posting about breaking it out over the mm -hmm. quarantine or self quarantine if you will so uh, but yeah all four games can be played completely separate separate rules booklets displays etc you know whatever you need's going to be there much much like the uh, original really the, the only uh, the only caveat to that one might be in how the maps were com maps were printed out there were a lot of little slices of map in the gdw editions for example uh, to to fill in part of poland there was a like, like a quarter sized map segment uh, that was printed and put in the in original games the um that isn't necessarily how the approach we took so the the two sheets of map for arctic front for example is one map sheet now so that but it covers the same area so you should just be able to lay out that the scandinavia map and uh the um the west germany map should be able to cover your western front game and then you've got the the two map sections for the the balkans which is a larger footprint there may be a little bit of overlap uh where there wasn't before and, and you're right I, I don't know if you want to comment to alan there are parts of the maps that get more or less play and that goes back to the comment i made well, you've got room then to put your displays in those less used areas or if you if you're not if you don't need that space because you're playing a combined game and you this is an overlap map section Right. And then the question here, Alan had a follow up question and I can answer this quickly. So uh, naval system, we actually we actually do have expanded naval rules uh, or, or that is our goal. But that would be for the completely new edition, because once you start bringing that into a game, it effectively changes the game considerably. And we want to honor the original design and keep it in that scope. This also helps us get the game out now rather than, say, two years or three years, a longer wait. I don't think anybody wants to wait another two or three years for uh, just uh, you know, a game they might not like as much as the original. So yes, absolutely, we have expanded naval rules um, available, just like there will be a, a complete effort around, a multi-month effort around the order of battle changing, which will require at least a year of playtesting to make sure it's, uh, it's worth the wait. So that will be a future. So this is talking futures of what's coming. Uh, somebody asked in terms of, you know, can you tease out uh, what's gonna be coming in the future? Um, yes, you know, I talked about already uh, sort of a new a new version, updated version, grand version uh, of the game with the Order of Battle. We'll definitely look to that. As Bruce Maxwell learned with NATO, it really changes the play balance in the game. He discovered a lot more uh, Warsaw Pact forces than were originally thought, and this would impact the Third World War series as well. So it might be a case where you create a new scenario around 89 where there were some changes and some of the disparities went away as the US built up, especially their air forces. So uh, that's something you're gonna see in the NATO release from Bruce Maxwell. He's already dealt with this question, but yeah, the goal is to have new order of battles, expanded naval systems, other, other new rules, other new optional rules. Uh, but we're treating that as a new game that requires a lot of play testing. So, mm. so that's something that will be a future project, much like Manchurian Front will be, uh, it's a separate standalone design which Eric's been working on for several years. Uh, that's gonna be a game that we're gonna be actually taking on next. So after the Third World War series is published, and I'd like to say the publication date, we've got charts and displays to do with, we've got a next, our next step is to do charts and displays for four games. And then we've got to do all the rule booklets, four rule booklets, then the combined rules. So I, I'd say we're looking out, you know, at best, you know, to get everything ready for the printers, that's going to take us near the end of the year to do it right, because all the proofing required, because you're talking about four game projects effectively, plus the combine. So, you know, there's a lot of work to go now into the displays and into the rules. Uh, but once that's done, we're going to move right over to Manchurian Front by Eric. And we'll talk more about Manchurian Front uh, as we get through this project. So we're definitely looking to grow the series. So it's also update this, this actual game, that portion of the map in Russia, which uh, Alan asked about, you know, yes, use it for player aid cards for now. There's really no use for it for a Third World War series, but we've made those maps available, realizing we might do some variants. There's some definite definite plans and thoughts in mind to use that. And there are some other opportunities for expanding the, this game to uh, some of the other theaters. Um, and I, I don't know if there are plans afoot, but I'm aware of something, another fan add-on in addition to the Manchurian front 
um, that in, it brought in the Korean Peninsula uh, and, and Japan. So there was there was some some work in that regard. I've seen also some uh, coming from some um, some folks in Europe about expanding it, connecting the two parts of Turkey and extending it down to the Middle East. There's a lot of there's a lot of well, good timing. Hey, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity in there, you know, bring in bring in the Middle East. Um, again, that's that's new. It's not play tested. It's yeah. not necessarily even something that's uh, you know that Compass has the rights to. But there is a lot of opportunities to take this and, and, and do some do some things that have already been explored. Um, yeah, absolutely. So the idea obviously is to enhance the original release, and uh, you know, with what we've covered today, and then we'll get into those newer. You know, we'll break into new ground with the Third World War series. But to, again, this would require a lot of play testing because the changes would be massive to the game. So I think everybody would understand to do real play testing and get serious about it. You're really talking about a minimum two year effort to do that, but uh, there's so much to enjoy. I mean, from I've seen people post that Third World War series was their first game or their, or their favorite game still to this date. So uh, why not get onto that game, do it right enjoy it for the next two or three years. And then in the meantime, we'll get Manchurian Front will be released. And we'll also be working on these, these expansions and this new order of battle and expanded naval rules, Turkey, et cetera. We can do all that uh, for the future. Uh, but we definitely want to you know, pay homage to, to, uh, to Frank Chadwick's work on the four designs and get that out the door and get it done right. So absolutely. So let's see, uh, I haven't had a chance to read this question yet. This designer's version will stick with the original, but they are looking at possible doing a 1989 scenario with the enhanced uh, order of battle. So this is happening right now. So uh, just to be clear, this is exactly what happened, which we didn't know up front. We didn't know this about NATO designer signatures edition. That is Bruce Maxwell's design that was published by Victory Games, I think early 80s. So the idea was Bruce Maxwell has this whole, you know, all this work on order of battle. And uh, he just quickly discovered Warsaw Pact was really underestimated, undermeasured. And when he got all the order of battle completed and he took it to the game map to NATO, his game, it's a complete blowout early on. Warsaw Pact, it's a steamroller. It's a steamroller scenario back in 83. So although that's maintained in NATO <laughs> with the new order of battle, uh, Bruce made the wise decision, and we've got like 15 play testers loving it. There's an 89 scenario where the U.S. Allied forces, NATO forces have been built up, have a chance to be built up. So, yes, if you imagine uh, if we took the order of battle that Bruce Maxwell has and applied it to the Third World War series, it'd be a completely different game, very far balanced in the favor of the Warsaw Pact. So we'll 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 deal with that situation after after this game gets published. Then I'm sure we'll look at an 89. It makes total sense to look at 89 for a Third World War series as a follow-on title because that's where the play balance gets, I think, really yeah. starts gelling properly. Uh, it's it's already it's already set at that time frame. We might be looking at some alternative um, historical oh, or a historical scenario for 83. For 83. Yeah, I, I, that would be uh, yeah, it would be pretty interesting to do a um, to look at how that would uh, what that war in Europe would be without the M1 and without the Apache available and the Leopard 2, for example, and other other advanced tanks before the T72 came out. Um, you know, those those were potential game changers with the hardware. So it'd be interesting to see if they're you know using some some separate yeah. Or a different type of 1989 yeah, scenario. So I, I apologize. I got I got NATO in my head. I was thinking we were in 83 with Third World War series, which was what NATO started out as. Here we're starting in 89. We've so, got we've got the map. We've got the layout. We've got the sound structure. Yeah. There's there's ways we can go. Exactly. And then there's a few more questions. Uh, I know Ken T was asking about new rules, etc. And then I'd say again, the blanket answer on new rules is that 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 automatically triggers a play test rule which changes the game, you know, when you have uh, any big key role changes. And we really want to package all these role changes and updated order of battle, at least for 89, obviously, which will which will hold up well, because 89 is a balanced, is a very well balanced scenario based on what Bruce Maxwell's done. So that's good news for this game. Uh, but we're packaging all that up for the uh, for the next, uh, you know, the next future edition. But for now, we're, we're really locking down what we've got here from the original release. So let's see here. Are there any final questions? We had a great participation. So I want to thank everybody. Uh, Chris, you've been great. You've answered, boy, 
we answered a lot of questions. What I'd like to do is go back to Mark Grad now. Mark asked the best question of everybody. He gets he gets the award because this is the question I ask before any designer signature edition project is, can the game be made better where it would be worth purchasing a designer signature edition? Or am I just OK with what I have already, and I'll just keep playing the Dickens out of that original release? So I'm hoping Mark will give a thumbs up <laughs> that uh, he's seen a lot of the changes, especially with the unit counters and everything that went into there with the mnemonics and, and all the you know player aids, et cetera. You know, hopefully you can see a lot of work's gone into this uh, project. Um, we haven't talked about any of the displays yet. We're just beginning work on the displays and then all the rule booklets, et cetera. So there's still a lot of work to be done, obviously, for this game. But uh, you know, things are looking good for wrapping it up this year. Um, because again, the maps and counters are basically locked down. So we're just moving on to displays and the rules next. So I'm going to give you the, uh, the final say here, Chris, since you've been so helpful today and you've been a, one of the key team members with Eric and others. So, uh, I'll let you go ahead and, and have any closing remarks that you'd like to share with anybody about your experience with this, uh, project up to this point. Well, I guess, um, if I were in the position of, of, of just seeing what I've seen today with the materials as a as a third world war aficionado fan um, as much as I am uh, and that, that's why I got into this project is because I love the game and I've played it so doggone many times but uh, just in the back of my mind thinking yeah I've got four games I can play it uh, well, a, my copy is getting worn to heck, and I can hardly see the counters anymore. So just playing it so much, sometimes you need to replace it from that standpoint. My goal, though, was not to just make a, you know, a reprint, but it was to try to make it easier to play. I'm, I'm big on, on removing obstacles to playability. And I don't mean major rules stumbling blocks, but just the little things here and there that add up. Um, yeah, and I really wanted to try to make this an easier game to play because it's not um, something for the faint of heart. You know, it's a it's not a difficult game uh, with the rules systemically. You know, it's a, but when you start adding all of these little things together, just the size of this being a monster game, yeah, it's pretty daunting. I and mean, just trying to get to, if two people try it, it's going to take you a long time. That's just the way the nature of the game was. Um, so I was trying to get a team together to play it and, you know, trying to make it easier to play. Um, so it doesn't take us uh, forever to get it done. So the game looks and I think plays much better than the originals. Now, hats off to the original graphics design. It was very clean. I love Rich Banner's counter style. I love his artwork style. I'm an old, old uh, Europa player and, you know, staring at those counters and maps for, for months on end, um, you, you, you grow to appreciate the simplicity. Well, we try to keep it simple, but provide where that, where that, in, that new layer of complexity, if you will, is intended to make things easier. Right. Yeah any sense. I, th I think that's a great uh, recap. And again, for everybody, just a reminder, the game is available for pre-order from the Compass site. I'll be adding uh, images of the maps and the counter sheets we showed today. I'll be adding all the maps and probably a good sampling of the counter sheets just to give everybody an idea, uh, you know, what things are looking like for the game. Uh, but really, I think what you said, um, Chris, really is a good recap. So what's unique about this designer signature edition is it's four games in one combined which could be a real monster undertaking. So taking those steps to really streamline play, adding mnemonics to the counters, et cetera, you know, being thoughtful about the new edition, I think it's gonna actually save people a lot of time with play gameplay, make things easier to get, you know, focus on the gameplay versus looking up something in the rules or going off somewhere else, not having to flip, you know, not having to change counters, but you can just flip the counter over when it takes a loss and there it is right there. That's a significant change actually, just yeah. having those reverse sides. I mean, that's that's a huge impact to the game when you multiply it out by about a thousand counters, you know, unit counters in the game. That's a, that's a huge impact uh, for gameplay purposes. So I hope for everybody that's watched today, I hope this has been helpful. I thought since this is such a large project and knowing the game, uh, the game has such a big following uh, online for many years, that it'd be nice to do a check-in point with you all today with one of our great esteemed uh, project team members here, Chris, and uh, just to let you know where we are at with the project and how we're looking forward to uh, taking next steps to wrap it up 
for this year. So again, if you found this helpful, I'll be happy to invite other designers on other games, uh, much like Chris is working on Fall of Tobruk for his next project. And you know we have a good many games in the pipeline. So if you'd like this kind of treatment for a future live session, very informal, as you can see as well. That's how I like to do things. So we, we go as we can. And you guys ask great questions today. I want to I want to thank Mark Brad especially. I wasn't meaning to pick on Mark. So I hope you didn't, I hope Mark, you didn't take it the wrong way. I wasn't meaning to pick on you, but Mark, you had some great, great question. You asked the best question today. So bonus points to you. Absolutely for your question about, you know, why the, why the new edition? What's in it for me? I, Great question. And uh, we had about 10 other great questions as well. And I really appreciate the uh, 50, 60 people that we had uh, live on today, about 57 right now still on with us. So thank you so much, everybody. Chris, thank you for uh, phenomenal mind. work. Uh, thank you for helping the other project team members. I wish I could have every project team member on. And my goal is to get as many of them on into a future uh, session as we get closer to releasing to the printer the whole package because everybody everybody deserves a victory lap the whole brady bunch thing going here with all the faces exactly all the faces involved so uh again everybody if we didn't answer your questions uh, i'll do my best so we can get answers to you over the the course of the next few days as a reminder the counter sheets are at the printers the maps will be going to print soon so we have time to make minor changes to the maps if needed um, the maps have been fully proofed <laughs> The maps have been fully proofed already, so if no map changes are needed, oh. we're we're good to go. But uh, there is time before the maps actually, and and there's a reason for that. Counters take longer to get produced and to get them back. There's there's more steps in the process with die cutting, so that's why all the eight counter sheets are, have been sent off. But the game map itself, if we find something or, or decide to make a late change, maybe, maybe based on a new player aid display, we want to add something. We've still got time to to adjust the game maps, but they're considered final proof uh, maps at this point, uh, but we can we can be flexible with that. So I want to thank everybody. Um, thanks for sticking with us for a full hour. If you did, my apologies if you did. We were shooting for a half hour, Chris, by the way. There's no way we could do this. You were right. No way, John. You talked too much for a half hour. So I Chris. I just too much about this <laughs> game system. All right, everybody, you have a great rest of your week. We're at the start of a new work week. So have a great week at work if you're at home. Uh, isolating or spending more time at home. Enjoy the games, enjoy the family. And uh, we look forward to catching you at a future live session. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Ciao.